Welcome, everybody. My name is Daniel Rothenberg. I co-direct the Center on the Future of War, and we're so pleased that you're joining us this evening. Uh, our guest tonight is Richard Wilson. He'll be speaking on the anti-human rights machine, digital authoritarianism, and the global assault on human rights work. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, this is the spring speaker series of the Center on the Future of War. We're a partnership between ASU and a think tank in DC called New America. We work on the on uh, exploring the different ways that war and conflict are changing. We do that through educational programming, through research and publications, and through a variety of outreach efforts, including this spring speaker series. So Richard Wilson, Wilson is the Gladstein Distinguished Chair of Human Rights and a professor of law and anthropology at the University of Connecticut School of Law. He's also the founding director of the Human Rights Institute at UConn. He's the author and editor of 11 books on international human rights, humanitarianism, transitional justice, and international criminal tribunals, including the definitive ethnographic study of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, The Politics of Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa. And his latest book is called Incitement on Trial, Prosecuting International Speech Crimes. Um, and we're thrilled to be co-sponsoring this event with ASU's Global Human Rights Hub. And we have with us Trisha Redeker Hepner, who's a political and legal anthropologist focusing on Northeast Africa and the Great Lakes region of Eastern Africa. And for over two decades, she's conducted research in the Horn of Africa and worked extensively with refugees and asylum seekers, including assisting hundreds of uh, in hundreds of asylum refugee cases. She also collaborates with forensic anthropologists and archeologists uh, addressing missing and identified dead in nor uh, post-war Northern Uganda's post-war transitional justice process. And she's published four books and many journal articles and directs the MA program in social justice and human rights in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences at ASU's new college in West Campus. Um, so really briefly, a little housekeeping. Um, uh, Richard will present his talk, and then um, Trish and I will, will moderate the Q&A. And we ask all of you in the audience to type your questions into the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll do our very best to get to everybody's questions. And so once again, thank you for joining us tonight, and the floor uh, is yours, Richard. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. It's a real pleasure to be here with um, Dan Rosenberg and Trish Hepner, who are both uh, longstanding friends. I admire them both very much. They do great work. And so it's a real pleasure to join you. I, I just can't help but pause. I've been feeling, you know, um, I've been feeling kind of uh, not well today. I've had some stomach bug or something, but also, um, you know, today's a day when one European power invaded a smaller European power. And so we haven't seen that uh, since the former Yugoslavia. Um, it's a really sad day for me. And I just want to pause uh, because war is never a good outcome. Uh, there will be civilian casualties. It's likely if um, Russia's involvement in Syria is anything to go by, that there will be uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, and so I just think we need to pause and reflect on that. And I'd like to personally applaud the people marching against the war in Novosibirsk and St. Petersburg, Russians, ordinary Russians who are showing a great deal of courage in opposing their government's decision uh, to, um, to engage in a war of aggression against Ukraine. So I just, I, I think that this uh, discussion today, uh, which is really about digital authoritarianism it's about propaganda 2.0. It's about the ways in which governments have used propaganda to target their opponents. Um, this is something that Russia and China have been leaders of, and, and these, these tactics have been copied all around the world. So I think the propaganda piece that we're talking about today is really an important uh, accompaniment. It's a corollary. It enables the kind of aggressive politics that we've seen from authoritarian regimes in recent years. So I'd like to uh, share my screen and um, start the presentation. So um, five years ago, I, I published a book on incitement trials. Uh, nobody really knew what I was talking about. They said, what are you working on? I'd say incitement. And they'd say, incite what? And, and it wasn't really a term that was being used, but I was very interested in 
what the prosecutors in The Hague at the ICTY and ICTR in, in Arusha and the ICC in The Hague uh, called propaganda trials. These were trials of individuals who participated usually in no other way uh, than by inciting others to commit uh, offenses against international law. And the question that motivated the book was, why is it so hard to prosecute insiders? Why is it that in the three or four tribunals that I looked at, did um, the defendant get acquitted 50% of the time? The conviction rate for war crimes is like 95% at the ICC, ICTY, at Nuremberg, and at <clears throat> the ICTR. The, the conviction rate for um, incitement and propaganda is only around 50%. So I was very intrigued as to why that was the case. And so if you want to find out, you can take a look at the book. Um, while I was doing that research, uh, social media exploded. And uh, we saw in particular uh, a wave of protests organized around the world, in Colombia, in Russia, all around the world, human rights movements, activist movements, civil society movements were using um, social media to organize protests. Uh, Gezi Park in Istanbul, uh, really social media became a, me a mechanism for, for political mobilization by civil society groups in that 2012 to 2014. But by 2015, governments had really caught on. And they thought, hey, we need to be in this space. And they started engaging in uh, techniques. Uh, these were particularly used by China and Russia. And in the beginning, they used surveillance and censorship. They simply shut, uh, shut things down. But then they moved to a different tactic, which was flooding social media with pro-government content. And instead of trying to cut off the civil society groups, they simply tried to overwhelm them with content. And they began with networks of bots. So these are automated accounts, fake accounts. They're automated. They're programmed to like or retweet when a, a, another person or another account posts. And, and they started to be shut down by um, the social media companies like Facebook and Twitter. Twitter was closing 50,000 fake accounts a day in 2019. So then the governments tried a different tactic, which was astroturfing. These are not fake accounts in the sense that they're bots or automated to software tools. These are real people tweeting, but they're getting paid uh, small amounts of money for every post. And these are, uh, for, for example, the 50 cent army uh, in, in China. And here's a picture of the 50 cent army at work for every uh, post or like that they undertake. And these sometimes led to grassroots movements. Uh, they started as what's called astroturfing, the creation of these fake groups that are led by government officials, but then they started to catch on. And that's a very interesting development because it kind of moved from very inauthentic to more authentic. They did generate real grassroots uh, pro-government movements, in some cases, uh, you know, far-right authoritarian movements, if we're thinking about um, countries like Serbia and Colombia. Uh, the techniques didn't just uh, stay confined to, um, to uh, illiberal regimes. Uh, liberal governments started using these techniques as well. Uh, the USA, the UK, South Korea, the governments have a presence on social media that is covert, that uses, of course, surveillance, uh, but also pushes content. Um, the Computational Propaganda Project at Oxford University found organized social media manipulation by 70 countries. And that, that, that figure is like 18 months old, so I'm sure it's a, a whole lot more by, by now. But we could, we could plausibly say that roughly half the countries in the world are manipulating social media. Um, this, uh, coincidentally or not, we could argue about that. Uh, this rise in government use of social media coincided with uh, the doubling of populist governments around the world. Populist governments rule in a particular way. Um, they have disdain for institutions. 
They use very sort of graphic uh, po political metaphors, and they may be of the left or the right. Many of these populist regimes are right wing, but you do have some left wing uh, populist regimes, and we could refer to AMLO in Mexico as a, as a populist uh, left wing regime. But many of them are nativist, they're chauvinist, they're anti immigrant, they're xenophobic, they, they play on racial and religious resentment. And so the rise of Donald Trump in the United States was very much part of this wider global move towards a populist style of governing. Here's another thing they do. They target any potential sources of accountability. Civil society, even their own government officials, judges, constitutional court judges, if there are judges who show a willingness to be independent, they really go after them on social media. Uh, so we've seen this, this targeting of journalists, human rights activists, judges, other legal actors as a characteristic of these populist uh, regimes and the use of uh, these new techniques on social media that we call Propaganda 2.0. Oops. Uh, Freedom House, I, I don't know if you just saw this, it was announced a couple of weeks ago, announced that, that uh, for the 15th year, there had been a global decline in democracy. So since 2006, uh, the world has been getting, according to the Freedom House Index, less rather than more democratic. So this is a part, we have to see these practices as part of a, a set of tectonic political shifts within the global political economy towards particular styles of, of governance. Um, just to give you a sense of how this is affecting human rights activists around the world, um, you'll find that, that uh, this is from Frontline Defenders, an Irish-based NGO, that uh, really human rights activists are under attack. The numbers killed in the Americas are the highest in uh, Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, those are the countries. Uh, in, in, in Africa, actually less, um, but in Asia, uh, you see the Philippines has really been a standout. Again, part of the kind of populist, right-wing, authoritarian style of government of Duterte. Um, and so this is uh, a, an interesting fact that of these, according to frontline defenders, of these uh, human rights defenders who have actually been killed, 85% have been previously threatened. Many of those on social media. So social media becomes integrated with uh, the physical attacks on human rights activists around the world. It's not a separate thing, the two are conjoined and we have to figure out how they're conjoined, what the relationship is. And that's really one of the key questions of this work. So here's an example of what I'm describing. This is a tweet from Guatemala uh, in 2019. The white van, the Pano Blanca, is a, is a, a um, Professor Rothenberg will know about this, uh, a, a, death, a death squad van from the 1980s. So they've set up an account essentially called the death squad van. And they tweeted that the prosecutors of FESI, which is the, um, the uh, UN sponsored anti-corruption unit that your days were numbered. And they were constantly going after them, uh, tweeting pictures of them in public places and saying, we're coming after you. And you see a picture of the white van, a hole in the ground and a coffin. So we saw this kind of rise in very threatening behavior. Uh, no one knows who runs the Pano Blanca account. It's an anonymous account. Um, here's another anonymous account, very influential in Guatemala called Yes Master. And this is a picture of Velma Aldana. Velma Aldana is the former attorney general of Guatemala who received so many death threats that she had to leave the country, apply for asylum, and she received asylum in the United States last year. And even when she was in the United States, pictures were taken of her and posted on this uh, Guatemalan social media account saying, you know, we see you, we know you, we are after you, we're following you. Don't think that even if you go to the States that you can get away from us. And these, uh, these threats were deemed credible uh, and she was granted asylum. Um, there's also something interesting about this and that is governments who carried out surveillance of human rights activists. And, you know, in the case of Belma Aldana, an attorney general, you know, for a really long time, 
But, but here, it seems like the surveillance is being done in the open. Surveillance is not being hidden as in the past. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence, which I have a paper, which I can uh, share with you, or hopefully it'll come out um, later this year, early next year, um, where there's a great deal of evidence uh, 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 found by journalists and others that uh, governments are behind these fake accounts like Yes Master. Uh, in the case of Colombia, the government was found uh, very easily because the government's uh, director of communications um, sent out to a WhatsApp group uh, his plans for attacking uh, opponents on social media and he included in the WhatsApp group a prominent journalist. He got the wrong, he got the wrong Carlos apparently. And so that story broke. There's a lot of evidence that that uh, there's their government in, involvement in these um, in these accounts. So the American Bar Association approached uh, me and my colleague Molly Land, and we ran a clinic here at uh, University of Connecticut Law School. And with a group of students, we put together a report that's available online, where we describe. Um, online hate speech against human rights defenders in Guatemala, but we think it also has generalizable uh, applicability. Um, for the ABA, I kind of wanted to go deeper. And so I started my own research project um, involving uh, some quantitative research and, uh, and qualitative interviews. And I wanted to understand how digital authoritarianism works and what effects it has on human rights defenders. thing that I wanted to do was to move away from the direct causation frame of analysis. There are a number of researchers, Muller and Schwartz, uh, Ru Russian and Edwards, who have sought for the kind of the holy grail of, is this online speech causal with respect to the killing of, 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 of people offline or offline physical assaults? Muller and Schwartz worked on Germany. And, and sought to see if there was a connection between far, a far right political party's website and attacks on refugees uh, coming from Syria. And they found a correlation, but not causation. I wanted to get away from the causation model, partly because there are a lot of people working on that. And, and I wanted to see if there were other things going on other than just asking the question, does this speech directly cause this crime? Partly because that's not, all that speech does. Sometimes speeches do cause crimes. But a lot of the time, speech seeks to create a, an atmosphere of tolerance for the commission of crimes. It seems it, it, it's dedicated towards tearing down people's reputation, making it possible to launch attacks against them. So it has broader, what I'll call kind of macro uh, effects, which aren't uh, as directly causal as the, the kind of direct causation theories would like. Uh, I was interested in dehumanizing speech. Um, I wanted to look at the content of speech targeting human rights defenders. And my theory was, was that a lot of it would be making direct threats and it would be dehumanized. It would dehumanize them because that was one of the categories of hate speech that gets the most attention in the literature. It turned out that that, as you'll see, that wasn't the case at all, which is why we do empirical research, because actually we find stuff that we didn't expect. And then I did some qualitative, there's qualitative research design, uh, looking at non-lethal effects, talking to human rights defenders who've been targeted online and asking them uh, about the effects on their life and their work and their health. Um, so looking, not just paying attention to to killings, but looking at the, the wider set of impacts on human rights defenders of online hate speech. So I was interested in psychological harms, effects on health. Uh, did it silence them? Did it lead them to censor themselves or not? Those are the kind of questions I was asking. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk to you about the, the, the quantitative piece, piece of this. Um, so I'm focusing here on Colombia and Guatemala. And we pulled 200 posts from each country of this type here, a survey, this is a surveillance photograph of two journalists meeting in a restaurant uh, posted on, online. Um, 
and we coded them by hand. Now, 400 is not a lot. Uh, so this is very preliminary. I'm working with a computer scientist and she, I, I wanna help her and she wants to go code like, you know, 6 million posts. Uh, so this is really the kind of um, pilot study for that broader kind of study that I won't be doing because I don't have those skills, but perhaps uh, I can work with a computer scientist who will. And, um, and we, we found in our coding of speech, um, 12 different categories that we saw pretty regularly. Direct threats, implicit threats. Direct threats are, we are going to kill you. Implicit threats are things like, bad things will happen to you if you don't stop. Lots of accusations of corruption. Human rights defenders are corrupt, they're stealing. They're subversives, they're terrorists. They're anti-patriotic. They're tearing down our, our, our country and, and our, our social order. They're criminals. A little different, a little similar to corruption, but, but, but different. Not just stealing things, but actually they're engaged in criminal behavior. Then surveillance, and the example I have of this post here is a surveillance post. That's how we categorized it. Doxing, which is releasing private documents online. Uh, and then dehumanization. Uh, this person is an animal. They're a scorpion. They're an ape. You know, they're a virus. You saw a lot of that. Um, gender and sexuality-based disparagement. Lots of misogyny online. This will come as no. Uh, this will come as no surprise to you, especially if you've read the Amnesty International report on online hate speech against women. Uh, and then narratives from the armed conflict. Uh, that you know, both Colombia and Guatemala had, had armed conflicts that have now ended and references to that still come up on social media. And then finally, our kind of catch-all basket of stigmatization, uh, statements like this person is disgusting or look how ugly they are. They're a human rights defender and, and they just revolt me. I think they're revolting. So those are the kind of posts that we would categorize as, as stigmatizing. So here's uh, what we found. The, I don't know if you can see this, but um, the, uh, the, the solid line is, is Guatemala, and um, the shaded line is Colombia. And I'll just point out a few things to you. Stigmatization, criminalization, subversion, corruption, those are really the top categories. Um, there is some variation within them. Um, we, we also were interested in um, a lot of the times the posts had a number of different categories within them. So they would stigmatize, but they would also engage in surveillance or they would refer to the conflict, but they would also say human rights activists were anti-patriotic. So there, um, we were interested in, you know, how, um, there we go, how they interacted with each other. So we plotted this. And as you can see in uh, Guatemala, it's very dense. There are very few posts that are just one um, statement. They often include multiple statements, but you can see on both of them that there is a, a kind of triangle or a pyramid that appears between criminalization and subversion, stigmatization and corruption. In each of those cases, they're connected the, 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 the categories come together. Uh, in Guatemala, you'll see there's more dehumanization. Uh, there are also more threats and much more surveillance. There's hardly any surveillance in Colombia and no direct threats. In Guatemala, there are plenty of direct threats. That interested us. Partly because in Colombia, there are 10 times the number of killings of activists in Guatemala and yet no threats online threats uh, 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 online seem to come in Guatemala, which has many fewer killings of activists. So here are some of our findings. There are many categories in addition to dehumanization and direct threats. Uh, we found few direct threats that doesn't seem to correlate with levels of killings. That, that tells us that something else might be going on, that it's not just about threatening and then killing. There's a whole other set, of a spectrum of other kinds of of intentions and consequences that we need to understand. There are cross-cultural similarities, um, accusations of criminality, gender and sexuality disparagement are very common, um, but there are differences. Uh, the levels of surveillance seem to be different. 
uh, governments in particular seem to use different levels of surveillance uh, on, online or exhibit it uh, more or less online. One thing we really don't know about are the interactions between the categories and what are the effects of those interactions. We don't know if corruption and criminality go together, what that means and what the effects are and how the effects are different than if corruption or criminality were uh, delivered separately. But we, we have a sense, and just our next working theory, is that, uh, that, that the combinations of these categories of anti-human rights speech do a particular work, but we're not sure what that work is. Because actually the laboratory tells us of the real world that, that the actors are, are putting these terms together with a particular intentionality. Okay, then here's the qualitative part. Uh, we did um, 56 qualitative interviews with human rights activists around the world, uh, 40 of them in Colombia and Guatemala. And we, we asked them a, a set of questions um, about uh, how they feel when they're targeted online, either themselves individually or their organization. We found 92% reported fear and being intimidated. That's quite a high figure. Um, there are not many questions you can ask where you get 92% of your sample saying, yes, uh, we feel this. Um, they feel that there's reputational damage done to them, that their reputation is harmed. Uh, Professor Rothenberg will know this in Guatemala in the 90s, um, leading human rights defenders like Helen Mack, uh, like Edgar Gutierrez, they were, they were widely respected by the population. Not all the population, but they had a certain authority. And um, social media is a way of tearing down that authority because repetition really works. If you see post after post after post saying that Helen Mack, and this is what they say about her, is a lesbian, that she's, uh, because she's Asian, Guatemalan, that she's like the coronavirus from China, all that really ugly speech, it starts to tarnish a reputation over time. Uh, there's just a lot of evidence in communication studies that repetition works. 56% of human rights activists are taking protective measures. They're going to work at a different route every day. Sometimes they'll take the car. Uh, very few of them are taking the bus and public transport. 56% um, said it, it interfered with their work being subjected to online, uh, online hate speech. 51% um, said there was a causal connection. We kind of had to ask this question. Do you think there are any offline harms as a result of social media? targeting of human rights activists. And, and there was a lot of debate amongst uh, human rights activists about this. 51% uh, thinks that there are physical harms as a result, that those are directly triggered by the speech, predominantly in rural areas, not so much in uh, Bogota or Guatemala City or Cali. But then there are 49% who, who think that, um, that, that there isn't a direct causal link between the online speech and offline harms. But of that 49% who say there isn't a direct causal link, the majority of them did say that they thought that online speech created an environment in which there was tolerance of harm against human rights activists, direct physical assaults. Um, in Colombia, less so, but in Guatemala, you see this a lot, there's criminalization of human rights work. Human rights activists are being arrested. And even if it's a frivolous case, a private denuncia, a private complaint is often lodged and they're detained and then released the next day. It really interferes with their work. I talked to human rights activists in, in Guatemala, uh, including in some quite rural areas who had like 50 criminal complaints lodged against them. And this, and, and it would worry them. They would say, well, I'll tell you some of the things they said when I get to that point. But they would say, this really impacts what, uh, you know, what I do and how I do it. 38% said they had health effects, they couldn't uh, eat, they couldn't sleep, they had insomnia, they had um, signs of stress. 
Uh, 26% said they engaged in self-censorship. Uh, they didn't speak as much. And then 18% said that they either had, uh, had, had made plans to leave the country, gotten visas, gotten passports. They had a plan to get out uh, quickly or had left the country. I interviewed some who were in the United States, such as Claudia Passipas, who's the former attorney general. Uh, and then 10% said, I don't care. They can say what they like. I think it's important to include these people. They're a minority, but they're a tough minority who simply said, yeah, they can say what they want. I don't really care. And uh, I'm gonna carry on doing my work regardless. I just wanna give you some of the, the language of those interviews. Um, and you know, I can't go through all of these slides, but um, just to give you a flavor of the voice of what people were saying. They use the social networks to get influence and manipulate your feelings and psyche. They make threats to sow chaos because that's how they control you. These are psychological operations to make you paranoid and they use fear to control you. It's propaganda 2.0. Uh, that's a Guatemalan defender. Uh, here's another Guatemalan defender. The harassment and death threats, uh, she's from a rural area. She's a rural indigenous activist. She said that she denounced a massacre by the army in her hometown, and then she got scared about her security. They profiled her entire family on social media. They put up, they put up pictures of her father and mother or siblings. Um, she said hate speech online is damaging in a way that's very personal and intimate. The threat is on your phone that's right next there to you. And this was a very powerful interview for me because it captured uh, some of the ways in which social media um, denigration and targeting and threats is different than if you hear it on old media, traditional media like newspapers or radios or TV, because your phone is right there with you all the time. And I think this uh, Guatemalan activist captured the degree to which um, she felt that the targeting was very personal and intimate, uh, targeting her family on her, and she could see it on her phone. She had to carry it around on a daily basis. Uh, reputational damage. This is a, a lawyer uh, in Guatemala saying, oh, people are saying I'm rich. Uh, oh, you're a millionaire. People would stop him in the street uh, and say, oh, you're a millionaire. You've made money. Um, People make comments in bars and restaurants. Uh, his daughter went out with friends who said your father is a thief and a corrupt lawyer. Example of reputational damage. People taking um, protective measures. Uh, some of the activists I interviewed had 24 hour police protection. That only usually came after they made a complaint to uh, the Inter-American Court or Commission of Human Rights, which um, directed the government to provide police protection. Uh, interference, uh, our staff go out to communities, uh, sometimes met with community members with machetes saying, we know you from Facebook. You human rights people, you're traitors receiving funds from international sources, and they would often cite Soros. So the, the language attacking Soros is just, one of those things that's been picked up uh, really everywhere. Um, here's a, a Colombian activist saying, these social media campaigns, they block your work, ruin your reputation and prepare the ground for taking your life. Hate speech in the United States does not lead to violence. Here in Colombia, yes, it does because there's not a gap between what is said and what is done. I mean, I, I think to me, that was another very powerful interview um, when people, there's a sense, there's a different cultural environment in Colombia. People say a, a direct threat. Uh, it's just taken a lot more seriously. Um, and it, it has to be because of the very high levels of interpersonal violence. Um, I'm going to head through because I have to wrap up soon and give time for um, uh, questions here. I want to give voice to the people who say no effects. I've been in the struggle for 28 years and I'm in my 70s, so I am tough. I block them and I don't care what they think. I don't lose sleep. They aren't going to kill me. But younger people are affected. Some are more sensitive than others. So here's a Guatemalan activist who's in, in their 70s 
and is saying, you know, it doesn't affect me because I'm older, but for younger activists, you can see that it really affects them. So there could be intergenerational. I haven't run, haven't run the numbers on this on my research, but uh, I did get a sense that there were intergenerational differences and that the harms were more um, likely to be felt by younger rather than older activists. Uh, so what are the consequences of digital authoritarianism? Well, I've tried to prove that we need to look beyond direct causation of physical assaults or killings to, to look at the broader set of effects. The effects on people's lives, their work, their health, how they undertake human rights work. There are a range of non-lethal negative effects that undermine human rights work, which is the intention after all. Uh, sowing fear, silencing people, leading them to like Thelma Aldana and Claudia Passi Pass in, in Guatemala to actually leave their country. And there are uh, Colombians as well uh, who fled their country, come to the United States, and then had pictures of them taken in Central Park, walking with their family and posted on media in, so, in, in Colombia saying, you may have fled, but you know we're still watching you. We're still gonna make your life uh, difficult. In that case, there was actually a death threat. Uh, so one question that is like the next stage of the research is what's the relationship between some of these offline non-lethal features and online propaganda? Criminal indictments. So I'd love to study and find out if criminal indictments correlate with the amount of speech targeting online targeting a particular human rights activist. Can we see any correlations there? Um, does criminal indictment link up with the health effects and abandonment of country? I have a theory, which is that the criminal indictments combined with threats are one of the main reasons that activists will actually flee the country. I think it's really the combination of those things, but I have a very small N of like five that I'm working with. So those are just suppositions. Um, and then I have some policy recommendations. So I'm an anthropologist in a law school. And one thing I really like about being in a law school is everyone says at the end of your paper, so what do you think we ought to do? And, and so I like being able to make uh, policy recommendations and, and actually try and think about how we might change our regulatory structure. I think we need a draft UN digital conduct, a code of conduct for states, that they have uh, transparency in their digital practices, there's oversight by parliament or Congress, and that they cease at a minimum, cease and desist from inciting violence against citizens. Uh, right now it's the wild west, states are doing all these different things, including uh, liberal states. And I think we have to build a movement to get states to commit to, um, to uh, not engaging in uh, digital authoritarianism in secret and for there to be proper oversight of, of uh, state activity and uh, for them to um, you know, stop engaging in inciting violence against political opposition, journalists and human rights activists to name but a few categories. Uh, social media companies, I didn't really get into this, but they do not pull content that is violent and threatening in Bogota like they do in Boston. You know, the, there's much more really ugly stuff in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, in India, for instance. Uh, direct incitement of communal violence is all over Facebook in India. And, and it, it's just not in the United States. So there, the social media companies have spent all this money moderating content in North America and Western Europe. And then just basically like whatever happens in the rest of the world, oh, we'll spend a little bit of money on that, but really not uh, take it that seriously. The, the, the level of moderation and protection that people have is directly uh, proportional to the size of the market for Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media company. They need to decentralize their content moderation, have in-country offices with native speakers. Uh, there are moder uh, content moderators who are not speakers of the type of Spanish in that particular place. Um, 
uh, a lot of the moderation is now being done by AI, by artificial intelligence, roughly 90% of uh, content moderation is being done. But, but you need people, you need uh, journalists, policy analysts who know the context. And we don't really, we haven't been able to see actually into the black box of the AI to know exactly how they are programming and what uh, triggers they're looking for in order to uh, pull content offline. I think we need to look at at-risk countries and have a category of countries where there are very high levels uh, of violence and treat them differently. Um, hate speech uh, can be benign in one context and uh, exceedingly exciting, inciting, and violent in others. That depends on the context that the speech is being uttered in. And I would argue for human rights defenders, judges, prosecutors, activists, others, um, that there are protected groups in at-risk countries like Colombia and Guatemala, where they're clearly under siege and their life is in danger. So uh, I believe that a pilot project uh, has started with Facebook doing this kind of thing. I hope it continues and is expanded. And then finally, I'd like to see uh, platforms um, be held liable uh, if they do not meet indus industry standards. So far, uh, no civil suits are permitted against companies. I don't think any company should have a blank check to do whatever it wants without any liability whatsoever. There needs to be liability for those um, uh, uh, social media platforms that, in the words I put language in here, do not exercise their duty of care to remove posts that are likely to cause imminent harm. So I'd like to stop there and uh, thank you all for your uh, patience and for listening and I look forward to comments and questions. So very briefly, everyone out there in the audience, please uh, put your questions into the Q&A box in Zoom and we'll start off with um, some responses from Trisha. And just before going on, Richard, that was a great presentation and you know it really shows just what interesting and always brilliant work you're involved with. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Richard, for a really wonderful presentation. Very informative, very interesting, very relevant to be sure. Um, we're gonna uh, see what pops in the question in the Q&A. There's a couple of things coming in already, um, but while we give people a chance to um, type in their questions, let me just ask you a sort of broad uh, question related to some of the, um, the current focus in, in human rights related thinking and research, which I'm sure you're familiar with, there's sort of two broad trends I'm, I'm thinking about. One is um, the, the kind of global trend that we see of the targeting of human rights organizations and NGOs um, to um, you know, reduce their effectiveness to silence, to intimidate, to threaten, right? There's across the globe in, in both, you know, liberal and illiberal countries, we see a trend of, of kind of clamping down on human rights related NGOs. And then similarly, we also see an appropriation of human rights discourse and concepts right. occurring um, in, in illiberal contexts, in contexts that appear to be, you know, inimical to the purpose of human rights um, concepts and, and law and so forth. So I'm just wondering, um, and, and I think both of these trends um, have produced, and I'm certainly not the only one to say this, a kind of cynicism of, of human rights. We're in a, sort of an age of human rights cynicism right now. Um, and I'm wondering how you see um, these trends relating to the particular issues that you're analyzing in your work right now. Sure, sure. I, I'm actually trying hard not to be a human rights cynic. Uh, I have been in the past. But I just think the facts have changed on the ground. Uh, this is not 1991, where um, human rights were being, you know, uh, touted as a global constitutional order. This is human rights in retreat. This is the rise of populist and authoritarian regimes. And uh, I want to act in solidarity with those human rights activists in Colombia and Guatemala and elsewhere who are seeking accountability. They're the only ones talking about corruption in the country. Um, they're the only ones pursuing uh, accountability for uh, conflict era crimes. And so, yes, human rights have been abused. They have been appropriated. They have been co-opted co by bad actors. Um, you know, governments have said, we are going in 
you know, uh, this military intervention on human rights grounds. But I think we have to use our powers of reason to distinguish between those cynical uses and, um, and, 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 and sort of legitimate and authentic uses based in grass, grassroots movements around the world uh, to pursue human rights. My basic view is that you just can't have anything approaching a democratic order without respect for some basic human rights. And just, you know, um, we could argue about what's in that list, but there's a list of things that governments should uh, do for their people and should not do to their people. And I just don't think that, um, that, uh, that, that we ought to abandon them simply because, you know, like every concept, you name it, democracy, socialism, freedom, liberty, they all get co-opted for cynical uh, purposes. Now there's another critique, which is coming out of, you know, Sam Moyne and all, uh, uh, and those actors who are saying that human rights have been a way to, um, you know, that the focus on human rights detracts from a proper socioeconomic uh, redistribution. Um, and and I, I actually think that, that that's misguided. Uh, and my argument is this, that, that a core feature of human rights grassroots movements, particularly in Latin America, I think that, that Moyne and some others are just ignoring Latin America, is, the, is that um, they're profoundly focused on corruption and they are leading the charge on anti-corruption. And corruption and violence go together. That by tackling corruption, you're also attacking the very unequal socioeconomic, uh, 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 very unequal socioeconomic uh, context that leads to violence in the first place. So I think there is an aspect of human rights that does get at the structural aspects of massive inequality and systems of violence. And that's through the anti-corruption measures that we see, particularly in Latin America, but you also see it in Africa and other places. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I think that because we're we're running a little bit short on time, I want to make sure we get to some of those questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Daniel to uh, let him moderate some of the questions that are coming in through the Q and A. But thanks for that, Richard. Sure. Um, so uh, one quick point, uh, Sam Moyne is going to be joining us later this session, so, so it's interesting you referenced him. Um, there's a number of questions that touch on a variety of issues. I'm going to try to condense a few of them so we get to as many members of the audience as possible. So let's, let's bring a few together. So there's a general interest in trying to understand how human rights groups are responding to these strategies, yeah. but let's link that to whether there is some perceived difference or in your data as to where these social media posts are presented. That is to say, are they on TikTok, are they on Twitter, are they right. on Facebook? Um, and, and then one other question to link in, because they do all go together, uh, to what degree does your research coalesce with the ways in which authoritarian regimes have used social media um, to or rather the way in which the social media companies have sometimes actually abetted the interests of authoritarian regimes, but wittingly or unwittingly. So these are all linked together, but I think they make sense yeah. to be brought together and maybe you could help us understand that a little more. Sure. So human rights organizations are responding in a number of really interesting ways. Uh, I would uh, direct folks to take a look at the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, on the protection of human rights defenders. Her name is Mary Lawler, and um, she's put out a report on direct threats against defenders just last year. And so this is really a topic of, of interest. So when the ABA called me in 2018, they'd seen my book on incitement, they said, will you work on this topic with us? Um, I was like, yeah, but you know, aren't there more important things for you to do? And they said, when we went uh, on our last trip to Latin America, there were dead bodies in the street of human rights activists. And what people wanted to talk to us about was social media. They felt like social media was a key component of this. And so that's why they wanted to pursue this line of inquiry. Uh, human rights organizations in Mexico um, are, are, are very sophisticated and they have done some very interesting network analyses of the actors and showing how they work together and coordinate 
they've um, uh, thrown open uh, the, the they're thrown light on the net centers. So net centers are um, troll farms. There are a lot of different words for them. They're places that are basically warehouses full of phones <laughs> that are programmed to tweet. And, and, and they've been, human rights organizations have been trying to reveal this stuff. They've been trying to say, uh, to, to do their own research, which is you know, very sophisticated technically, to, to identify those net centers and show how they're being operated by governments. And they've been successful at that in Guatemala uh, and also in Colombia. Although the Colombian intelligence services keep making mistakes and getting caught. So they actually, when, when, when the uh, Santos and the FARC were negotiating the peace accords in Cuba, um, the Colombian military intelligence actually uh, wiretapped them, but they got caught doing it. And so, um, so really uh, making the connections to the government. But, but there, are, there is dark money behind this stuff. There's dark money that we don't know where it comes from. We think it comes from business associations, but there's not really strong proof of that. Casif in Guatemala, um, possibly, but we're, we're not really sure about that. Um, where is this material presented uh, is a really good question because it varies from place to place in the country. This is true in much of Latin America, what I'm about to say is that Twitter is where the urban professional classes are. Twitter is largely in Mexico City, Bogota, Sao Paulo. Rural cultivators uh, are not on Twitter generally. They're on Facebook. And so fa there is a real division between urban and rural. Um, Facebook is much more popular amongst young people um, and rural people, uh, people living in rural areas. And WhatsApp is also, um, a very powerful organizer in rural areas. There are whole communities in rural areas where everybody's on WhatsApp. And that's one of the main ways that pictures and images are shared. It's a problem studying that because it's a, it's a sealed private platform and you, you can't get into those networks and see what's, what's going on. Um, but there is a lot of evidence that, uh, for instance, in India, that a lot of communal violence has been organized on WhatsApp. Um, as for the companies, um, I think so. I think aiding and abetting is a strong word um, that 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 implies that they're providing some practical assistance. I mean, that's the definition, the legal definition of aiding and abetting is providing practical assistance uh, with an awareness of the intention of the person committing the offense. I think more often they're just negligent. They're negligent because they don't want to spend the money on it, or because the taking protective measures could hurt their business model. And so I think it's kind of willful negligence. I don't know if it rises to something else, but um, there's certainly negligence at times because they know there's not anything I know that they don't know. They know all this stuff. I've pointed it out to them as have many other researchers and they're aware of it. They have powerful tools that allow them to see all this stuff. And so uh, there's nothing that, you know, that a researcher is going to tell Facebook that they don't already know. So the question is, how do we get them to act? How do we get them to act in ways that are more pro-democracy, that are more protective of groups in society who are challenging very unequal and violent political orders uh, that you see, you know, around the world? And they need to take sides. They need to clearly take sides. And, and suffer themselves reputational damage when they don't. Let me ask you a question that's sort of interesting, particularly with the, the anthropological you know, uh, intuitions on this. You focus a lot on the content of the messages, but we don't have a lot of information as to the sort of tone or communicative style. And I'm wondering if right. you see in these social media communications, the importance, let's say, of humor, as opposed to just th direct threats. Is there, is there something else going on here that isn't just the kind of intense, we're on your case uh, quality of the communications? And if so, what might that tell us about social media? Sure, yeah, I mean, 
in in social media, there's a real focus on the lulls, you know, the laughs, um, making fun of people at their expense. And that's definitely a feature of the post. So uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because a lot of times you'll see the emoji of someone sticking their tongue out, you know, um, uh, a, a lot of humor, a lot of ha ha ha. I mean, it's not my humor. I don't think it's funny, but they think it's funny. They think it's funny to to um, uh, to engage. And for instance, uh, Juan Francisco Sandoval uh, was the head of the anti-corruption unit in Guatemala, prosecutor. He was really going after some of the top level politicians and their involvement in money laundering and a lot of other things. And they were constantly po posting pictures of him on a women's bot, on a woman's body, sometimes in graphic sexual pictures. Uh, they were saying that he was a homosexual. There was a lot of gender sexuality disparagement. And they thought that was really funny. There was all these people just dying of laughter about it and, and thought that was really, you know, a gas. Um, so, so definitely the, the tone is, is one of, um, playfulness often, but sometimes it's really just dark. Sometimes it really is, we're coming after you and your days are numbered and we're the white man and you know who the white man is because um, in, in Colombia, you, you see people saying, I'm sending the motorcycle. Manda la moto is, in, is the expression in Colombia because so many assassins um, arrive on a motorcycle and shoot people and then ride off on the motorcycle. So, um, you know, there, there, there is that kind of disjuncture between the very serious and scary and, and that which is humorous and playful and using popular memes, um, you know, uh, trying to be jokey about what they're saying. So we only have a few more minutes, but I thought I'd bring together two questions, which is one question is, you talked about some of the impact of these threats, but but to what degree have they worked if their intention is to stop this sort of effort? And related to that is this question of, of where you stand on the kind of optimism about this human rights work. Is all of this pressure really a sign of its effectiveness? Yeah. It, certainly powerful actors want to take down uh, human rights activists and they want to remove judges that are not in their pockets. And so the pressure of civil society in, in many of the societies that I've worked in is the only pressure on the dominant political economic elite. Like, you know, civil society pressure is all there is that's holding anyone accountable. Uh, so definitely they want to remove them. And in, in, in uh, Guatemala and in uh, other countries in Latin America, the human rights movement has pursued successfully accountability for perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Rios Montt was convicted of genocide. Um, you know, there, there's uh, convictions of Skilingo in, in Argentina. Um, you know, Pinochet was stripped of his immunity uh, shortly before he died. So there is, there is pressure. And, um, you know, I'm always admiring the uh, the doggedness of the human rights movement. Um, and, and the impact is to interfere. It hasn't stopped human rights work, but it definitely has interfered uh, with human rights work. And many human rights activists have gone off social media. They're not using social media to organize and to mobilize. And so they're just taking a break from it. You know, They may go back, but they're just like, I, I can't be in the space anymore. And to that extent, some of these efforts have been successful. Uh, but of course, human rights work changes. You know, it goes in different directions. And uh, when one door closes, another one opens. Social media was a huge boon in the beginning. In 2012, it was a massive resource for um, social movements around the world to organize against political leaders. It was provided a space for that Vox Populi and also for for uh, organization, but um, actors uh, who were opposed to that uh, very quickly came around to um, creating their own technical structures to oppose it. And thus, you know, they, 
when civil societies go up against states, states just have so many more resources, like the Chinese Communist Party. It's just got huge resources. Any civil society actor is going to be weak uh, when faced with that enormous capacity. So thank you so much to our colleague, uh, Professor Redeker Hepner, and to our speaker, Professor Wilson, and to all of you for joining us this evening. This has been a fascinating presentation. We hope to have you back again and um, wishing everybody a very good night. Thank you, and thank you for your questions.